stick just changed around here, buddy. You're looking at it. You are now listening to the Outsiders Podcast, the most exciting and hard-hitting show on the net. And now, bringing it hard as always on the Kansas City Chiefs and the NFL, here are your hosts, Clint Schweitzer and Noah Groniger. And it's Raiders week here on the Outsiders Podcast. Clint and Noah joining you as always, talking Chiefs and Raiders, uh, their first meeting of the season taking place Sunday at Arrowhead. Brady Quinn will be starting his second straight game. Uh, Noah, you wouldn't know it, but this Chiefs, Ra- Chiefs Raiders thing used to be actually be like a big rivalry. It's insane. Yeah, back 70s, 80s, even the 90s with Tim Brown and Jeff George and Napoleon Kaufman, great guys. <laughs> hey, the Chiefs dominated the Raiders in the 90s. I believe Marty, who put such an emphasis on the game, the Chiefs only lost like three or four times in the whole decade of the 90s, including a playoff win. So Chiefs used to used to own that thing in the 90s. Uh, the Raiders uh, got our number a lot back in the 70s, and we're going to be bringing on some great guests today talking about this game. Uh, guys, Mr. Raiders himself, George Atkinson's coming on, kind of nervous about that, kind of worried that he might give us a forearm shiver if we were to go over the middle with a question. Well, we better not go over the middle then. <laughs> yeah, very much so. I asked Lynch Swan about that. And uh, Bill Moss is going to be joining us uh, from the Chiefs side of things. So we got two, two different uh, contrasting styles, uh, two interesting perspectives of this game. Our perspective, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I think this game, as Brady Quinn comes in starting his second straight game, it's a game the Chiefs can definitely win. Uh, but where is it going? I mean, the, the Raiders have shown, I think, to this point, to be a better football team than Kansas City, though. Oh, definitely. I mean, I see the Chiefs losing this game. Brady Quinn, I don't have much more trust in him than I do Matt Castle. They're both really bad. Uh, the Raiders' defensive line is really strong. Their front seven is really strong. Uh, their corners that they picked up in the offseason, Ron Bartell, and Shante Spencer have been coming along, and I don't see any way we can win this game. It's going to be close. It's going to be low scoring, but I say we lose. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I think the Chiefs at 1-5, and five, uh, and we're going to ask Bill Moss about this, you know, maybe how they spent their bye week. Uh, did they did they prepare as a team? Are they preparing as a team trying to get back into the thick of things to maybe win a division or even compete? Or are they a team that's maybe folded it up? We're going to find out because I think the Raiders, as we found out, they were down 17-3 to to Jacksonville a week ago. They managed to come back and win that game. Now, Blaine Gabbert and Maurice Jones-Drew had come out of that game, and Jacksonville and was Chad on the road. And couldn't get a first down. Well, that's to be expected. They'll probably be our quarterback next year. So probably. It's going to be great. Never Matt Moore. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the Raiders, to me, seem like a team that uh, they almost beat the Falcons two weeks ago. They seem like a team that maybe is ready to, to turn the corner. They have uh, their coaching staff in place, their management in place. So i got to give the edge to them in this case. Yeah, I mean, Darren McFadden hasn't really gotten off to a strong start this season. People are wondering why, as am I. I mean, he's healthy. He should be a beast. He should be one of the top five running backs in this league. Uh, The Raiders beat the Steelers this season. Uh, They give the Falcons a close game, and then they come out and look like garbage against the uh, the Jaguars, excuse me, until Gabbert and Jones Drew come out. Yeah. Henny can't get a first down. Things change. They come out with a win. So these this are still teams we're dealing with uh, at the bottom of the division. I think the the Raiders can maybe get back in this, uh, given how San Diego and Denver are prone to perform. So we'll see what happens there. But you know, uh, it's it's interesting coming off a of bye week. I just feel really deflated about the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't even know at this point that, I mean, I'll always be a quote-unquote Raider hater. I'll always want to beat the Raiders. But at the same time, gosh, at 1-5, and five, you're talking about a quarterback right now. I mean, you got to be. I, the, the Chiefs need uh, maybe more than anything to, uh, to maybe lose some of these games. I'm sorry to say it, but they do. Yeah, some fans are hoping that Brady Quinn comes on, leads the team as our franchise guy from now on, but I don't see it happening. He proved in Cleveland and Denver, and so far here in one game that he is not a franchise guy. We need to go out. We need to get one in the draft or through a big, big, big trade, but I don't see that happening. It's got to be a first-round draft pick. Well, guys, we're going to be continue breaking down this game, and we got two very special guests. And I'll tell you what, we're getting ready to bring George Atkinson on. This is Mr. Raiders, guys. Ten-year career. Raiders. Hey, this was as intimidating a player as you've seen this guy. Him and Jack Tatum, Fred Blitnikoff, Gene Upshaw. This was an intimidating bunch. Back Our shell. The, yeah, late 60s all the way up to the, uh, I believe he played it with Oakland until 77. So he's going to have some stories, and I cannot wait. Because uh, hopefully he treats us well because, you know, I'm kind of worried. He's, a, he's an intimidating guy. But he's a nice guy, so I, I th- we'll see how that how that goes for us. I'm just scared about the forearm shiver, but here we go.
Okay, guys, we're continuing to talk Chiefs and Raiders this week, and actually right now we are being joined by Mr. Raider, George Atkinson. Of course, you can catch him as the host of Behind the Shield. You can also catch him as a pre- and post-game show host on Raiders uh, Network. Super Bowl champion George Atkinson, welcome to the show. How you doing, George? Oh, man, I'm doing well. You know, just kind of enjoying soaking up some of the sun on the West Coast. Well, yeah, you, that, that is something that we cannot say here in Kansas City, of course. Uh, you guys have always had that on us, at least. Uh, here, George, as we go into this game here, uh, the, the Raiders come in at 2-4. and four, Chiefs are 1-5. and five. I mean, are the Raiders about where you thought they would be at this point? Or do you, uh, they played Atlanta tough and coming off a big one at Jacksonville. Are the Raiders where you thought they were at this would be at this point? You know, I, I thought they would be probably uh, playing at 50% right now. I thought they were probably probably be 3-3, three and three. and they had a chance at being 3-3, three and three. Uh, I guess probably when they played against Atlanta, I thought they played a good enough game to win, but as football guys would have it, once again, the race fell short. But I think this, this team is starting to, to find its identity, especially on the defense. Offense, the jury is a lot, but uh, I think it's the key the key to this team's success will be once they find their agenda. And, and, I, and I think that's one thing that's, I mean, you had Darren McFadden healthy uh, for the first time in a couple of years, and I think that's going to help. I mean, do you do you feel like Carson Palmer right now is playing up to, to the level that he needs to be, or do you think that's maybe part of the problem? No, you know, I, I think the, the biggest problem with the offense right now is the fact that they, uh, they're not able to run the football and use McFadden to his uh, most effective uh, effectiveness, and I think this team eventually will get to a point where they'll, they'll find the key to getting McFadden uh, to a point where he can perform the way he can perform, putting him in a position to make plays. I think right now the running game is the thing that has hurt this ball club, not being able to really run the ball, and McFadden not being in the threat that he can be, I think just crippled his offense. So, I think once they find out what uh, once once it opens up and they find out what needs to be done to get him holding, I think this team will definitely go uh, deep deep into the AFC West playoffs. Do you think Dennis Allen is the right coach to get back to the commitment to excellence for the Raiders? <laughs> well, he's done so far so good. I, I, I think the guys have made a, a big improvement in a lot of areas under him. I think they are starting to really you know, feel him and accept him as a coach. And that's the biggest thing about a new coach coming in, especially the young coach, is that, you know, players have to get to know him. And they have to feel comfortable. They have to feel that they can trust him. They have to feel that they want to play for him. I'm saying it's because it needs to be a group effort, not individually. And uh, I think right now this team is starting to feel him and they're, they're getting to know him and they're responding to him. And I think part of his personality, him being an ex-defensive back and being being an aggressive player when he was in college, I think I think he's starting to see this team team not only become aggressive, but they don't give up. They didn't give up against Atlanta when they were down. They didn't give up. That's what you got against Jacksonville when they were down 20 points in the third quarter. So. You know, this team is, 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 is starting to come together. It's just a matter of time before the pieces fall into place. George, I want to go back to your career a little bit. Of course, you were uh, you played with the Raiders for 10 seasons and uh, were part of many uh, games during this Chiefs rivalry. I mean, this dates back to the AFL days. Talk about what it was like playing the Chiefs back then and maybe how the rivalry has changed uh, these days. <laughs> back then when we played Chiefs, it was a knockdown, dragout affair. And uh, we didn't like them, they didn't like us. We saw them twice a year, uh, and we wanted to beat them both times. And I'm, I'm quite sure they felt the same way. But it was a good rivalry, and a lot of friends that I developed over that period of time. You know, competitiveness, that's the way it is. You compete on Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays. You can say hello to each other on the phone if necessary. But uh, it was a great rivalry, man, because uh, both teams were good football teams. Both teams had competitors on both sides of the ball, and neither team wanted to lose to the other. So that, that made it a good rivalry. And, uh, we played hard against the Chiefs, and they played hard against us. And I enjoyed the rivalry. Uh, you know, Kansas City, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Denver, those teams I uh, enjoyed playing, playing against because they were, they were built the same way we were, and that was based on aggressiveness, speed, and, uh, you know, uh, players who love to play the game. 
Can you talk about your rivalry with the Pittsburgh Steelers and specifically with Lynn Swan? You guys had a few uh, mix-ups there on the field. <laughs> yeah, Lynn Swan, right. Uh, it was a good rivalry also. You know, Pittsburgh was a tough football team, contrary to whatever you know, I may say about Lynn Swan or what have you. They were good football players, and uh, they played hard. They came to play. You knew when you played Pittsburgh just like you knew when you played us. And it was a knockdown drag out of there. And it wasn't going to be pretty. And that's the way we played. That's the way it was. And uh, that's the way to go down in history. And certainly, I mean, there were individual rivals like myself and Lynn Swan and you know, Franco and Phil Villapiano. Right? Those kinds of things. But that, that made for a rivalry, but also it made for a for uh, good football, and uh, when you saw the two teams play, the Raiders and the Steelers, you knew it was going to be a knockdown, drag out of there, and it was going to be a good football uh, game, and that we provided for the fans, and I think the fans appreciated that. Do you still enjoy the game of football as it is today, or do you miss the you know, times when you I'm around it still. Do I enjoy it? Um, I think there are a lot of things that taken away from the mystique of football. I think there's too many shoots involved and not enough football people. Uh, I think you got people making decisions who have never even donned a helmet and more or less played on a football field. There's making decisions in the league that uh, uh, that I think is taken away from the attractiveness of it. And, and I have twins that play. You know, I have sons that play Notre Dame and uh, you know, watching them sometimes and uh, watching the, the game of football right now, it's, it's a little bit soft. And it's, it's not what I'm accustomed to, and it's not what the kind of conditions I'm playing on. And thank God I, I did, because I came along during the era. But football players were football players. It wasn't about the money. You know, it was about the love of the game. Uh, contact was contact. And, uh, you know, we didn't have the thousands of of concussions that these guys are getting uh, for whatever reasons or and I think it's bad technique I mean uh, the games that we played we were aggressive and our techniques were had to be intact to be aggressive and today they've taken aggressiveness out and the techniques have fallen off which means that, that you get guys approaching tackles now totally vulnerable to injury and this is due to the decisions that the NFL has made to try to avoid injury I think that they're creating more injuries because they're taking away from the nature of the game. And the nature of the game is aggressive. And, I, and of course, you know, as we look at the Oakland Raiders as a franchise, it's been uh, 10 years since they've had a winning season, since they went to the Super Bowl in 2002. As we look forward to this game uh, against the Chiefs on Sunday, uh, do Raiders fans and maybe yourself feel like that, uh, that they can get back in this AFC West mix? And uh, is this a... No, you, look at the, you look at the AFC West, and it's very interesting. It's the leaders are three and three. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it's, it's wide open. You know, it's, uh, and whoever catches fire at the right time, the Raiders are out, Kansas City's not out, Denver's not out, not San Diego. I mean, it's a wide open race for for the division. So it's a team who catches fire uh, first, who, who wants it the most that will get it. I mean, I think right now this, this division probably is, as mediocre as I've seen it, and uh, but I, I think it's anybody's anybody's division, and uh, the Raiders have as good a chance as any, and they have they have a chance to win the division, especially it's just a matter of them catching fire right now. I think they've had a couple ball games that let them know that you know winning is about effort, and these guys have, have definitely shown some effort. I think Kansas City is going to be a for fight to the finish if they want to. If not, the Raiders will run away with it. Uh, speaking about that, what's the game plan you think the Raiders will have coming into Arrowhead on Sunday? I, I don't have a clue what the game plan will be. I mean, I you know you're dead I don't have to tell you that one. But I, I do think that, I mean, they're just basically looking at both teams. I think the Raiders will start out like every team does, trying to run the football, establish the run. And uh, then, uh, you know, incorporate the passing with and, and whatever comes up in between, you, you exploit that. But the, the thing also is that they got to remain aggressive, I think. And uh, they got to cause and create 
stuff, George. I completely agree with you. I'll tell you what, before we let you go, uh, you mentioned your uh, twin sons playing football at Notre Dame. Uh, give us uh, give us a little bit of how, how that feels uh, and just how proud of you must be as a father to have that happening. Yeah, you know, I am proud of them, you know, uh, and uh, they're playing well right now when they get a chance to play. I'm more, I'm more concerned about their education than I am about football because, you know, that's a fleeting moment in your life. Uh, I think that they have a chance to get a great education, and that's my biggest concern right now is their education and making sure that they try to stay in their books as best they can so they can get their education. Cause like I said, you know, football is, is fleeting, you know, and the way it's played today is, you know, your career is wrong. So uh, yeah, I am proud of them, but I'll be even prouder when they get their degree. Oh, great stuff, George. Completely agree. You sent him to the right school for that. Uh, we'll look forward to this Sunday, see what happens. Chiefs and Raiders will be listening. We'll be watching and, and listening to Behind the Shield that you host. George, cannot thank you enough for joining us today, coming on to talk to a couple Kansas City boys. Just don't forearm chivalrous in the neck or anything next time. <laughs> you know, I will if you come across the middle. I got history on that. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we just watched the lens form to it. Put the hook on you, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, we we won't be coming around the middle with you. D don't don't worry about that. No, I'm terrified. <laughs> All right, Georgia. Hey, we appreciate it, man. You have a great one. Yeah, we'll, and, we'll... and let me say one thing, man. Sure. Our uh, oldest Taylor, who's a guy I played against, uh, you know, uh, I heard somebody tell me that he's been sick. I guess in that area. I just want to wish him well. If he if he uh, has a chance to hear this, I want to wish him well. He's a he's a guy that I played against and I admire for being the type of player that he was and respected. And I uh, just want to say hello to him if he's listening, if anybody knows him. Tell him I said hello and hope he gets well soon. That means a lot, George, because, uh, you know, you guys were fierce rivals back in the day, and uh, Otis, is a guy I believe, should be in the NFL Hall of Fame. And, uh, oh, man, yeah. you know, that's another deal we can go into. That's a shame, isn't it? He's oh, yeah. not in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, some great times. It's great to have all these Chiefs guys and Raiders guys talking so kind. I don't know if John Madden would be okay with this, but I kind of like it. <laughs> now that we were playing against each other. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's all different now. But, hey, George, we appreciate it. You're a great one. Uh, we'll, we'll be watching, and we'll uh, we'll catch up with you another time, my man. Make sure, man. You got my number. Call me inside. Hey, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Take care, George. You got it. And great stuff from George Atkinson. I'll tell you what. He had some really good things to say about Kansas City, and uh, I'm kind of surprised, honestly, but really good. Yeah, he wished uh, Otis Taylor a speedy recovery, as do we all. And uh, he mentioned that if we are ever near him, he will lay us out if we come over the middle. Oh, hey, you can promise, I'll promise you this, I will never be going over the middle in any situation, let alone with George Atkinson there. I don't care, age 65 or not, that guy is... Uh, is a killer. So <laughs> I've been thinking about taking a trip to California. I'm gonna have to bring my helmet and shoulder pads just yeah. to be safe. You better bring a lot more than that. Maybe an I an IV and some uh, and <laughs> and a respirator. I don't know. Anyway, George, great to have him on, and uh, we look forward to talking to him. You know, down the road. But uh, guys, we're gonna be bringing Bill Moss on next, and uh, of course, Bill. He's a chief, and he's gonna have probably a lot to say about the current state of this team, and maybe the rivalry in general. We'll ask him because he, of course, played in the rivalry as well quite a bit. Yeah, he's been all over the shows this week on uh, 610 and uh, just... Yeah, I think he's going to have a lot of stuff to say, you know, about this regime, about Pioli. He's, he's been outspoken that he thinks Pioli may be on his way out. So we'll ask him about that. And we got Bill Moss coming right up for you. And we're still talking Chiefs and Raiders coming up this week uh, with Bill Moss. Bill, welcome back to the show. And uh, what are you thinking going into this game? The Chiefs at 1-5, and five, Raiders at 2-4. and four. Uh, What are your thoughts heading into this? The Raiders may be a little bit better than we thought after last week. 
Yeah, you know, the Raiders, you know, they, they, they're thinking on build a new direction, obviously, and that there's sometimes there's, uh, uh, it takes a little while to get going. But, you know, I think they've got a pretty good group of, of talent-wise, uh, a pretty good roster. Um, you know, they've got a, a veteran quarterback. They've got a big offensive line. They've got some playmakers on defense. Uh, and they've made some changes in their defense. Uh, they, they, they've taken Orlando McLean out on, on the nickel stuff. He was a, as you know, a couple of years ago, he was a big middle linebacker, came out of Alabama, and I thought it was going to cause us nightmares. And he is. He's a beast against the run. But um, in, in passing, in the passing downs, they, they've taken him out and replaced him. And they've gotten, over the last two weeks, a little bit better on, on the defensive passing side of things. Um, they can run the football. You know, they just, they, they still have a little bit of that greater mentality where, you know, they, they shoot themselves in the foot. Um, they're trying to get them a the, the new regime to get them out of that those old habits. But uh, I think it's a little bit of a process. For the Chiefs going into this, uh, you know, off, off a of bye week, uh, obviously. Um what was accomplished during that bye week. Uh, the biggest thing that this team still doesn't have is an identity. Did they find one in the bye week? I've been around football for a long time, and I think the only way you like make an identity as a team is to go out and become something. Is to go out and, and, and do it. Either you're you know, a, a big passing team with a, a rocket quarterback like the Green Bay Packers, or, or you're uh, the, the New York Giants and your defensive line and your offensive line, you're going to pound the ball and we're going to get after you on defense, you know, and you're going to make a couple play action passes with an accurate quarterback and those things. You, you have to play the game to, to be that, to get an identity. You don't get them during the bye week and, and uh, the Chiefs are still searching to find out what they are. And the first step of this now is going to see what they are with Brady Quinn at the helm. Uh, do you think that if we don't trust Brady Quinn to throw the ball, can we run the ball effectively on this talented defense like you mentioned with Rolando McLean, Richard Seymour, Tommy Kelly, Lamar Houston? Yeah, you know, that's the thing. When we played the Raiders over the last, I'd say, three, and a half, three years, uh, what they've done to us, the key to how they beat us was their defense just uh, literally beat the hell out of our offensive yeah. line. I mean, it was a bloodbath. And... and the pocket would close fast, and you know, if anything, I, I believe that part of the reason that the, the switch was made at quarterback is because Romeo was here. He's looked at the play over the last couple of years at the quarterback position. Quarterback Matt Castle knew what the Raiders are, and he knew how fast that that, that uh, pocket would collapse, and he wasn't going to have any part of it. And I think he, that the switch, you know, some of the reason was that Brady Quinn is a little bit more mentally tough to uh, go out there and, and can compete against a, a defensive front that's going to push push our offense around a little bit. Uh, talking about the rivalry a little bit, of course, uh, uh, in your later years with the Chiefs, with Marty Schottenheimer, he obviously, you know, he was outspoken. He did not like the Raiders. Uh, do you feel like the rivalry? We just actually had George Atkinson on as well, and he he kind of alluded to this too that maybe the rivalry has uh, maybe lost a little bit of its luster. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think a rivalry in a division has to do with you know the team. Um, you know, you're you're always going to have your disdain for you know, the Raiders and, and and the Denver Broncos and San Diego Chargers. But it's a team that's good in the division that really, really uh, stirs up a rivalry. Now, the Raiders' rivalry goes back to the way they played in the, in the you know seventies and threw Lenny Dawson and Otis Taylor around and the things that they did and then they, you know they were winning Super Bowls. And then and in the eighties they won two Super Bowls in the eighties. And I remember you know it was fresh in our mind. You're watching these guys on television win Super Bowls and and you want a piece of that. You want a piece of greatness, and so you want to beat up the best, and you want to go go after them, and and that that causes a rivalry. Then in the '90s, you know the the uh, Denver Broncos. Well, even before that, in the, in the late '80s, Denver Broncos were going to Super Bowls with John Elway carrying his team, and then in the '90s they were winning Super Bowls. Well, we want a piece of that too. Um, so, but lately, you know the the, the the Chiefs and the and the Raiders have been yeah they're in your division. 
position, but both of them, both teams are kind of lacking a lot of, you know, oomph, if you will. And and there's not there's just not much to it. They're just both of them think you look at each of us as, as a win on their schedule. Uh, what do you think of the Raiders' secondary with their two new corners, Ron Bartell from the Rams and then Shante Spencer uh, coming over from the Niners? Well, I think they're still in a transition period, but these are talented guys. Uh, and, and I think that's some of the things I was talking about earlier. They're, you know, they, their past defense has you know, suffered a little bit, but uh, you know, they're starting to make that turn. You can see that when, you, when you're dealing with talented guys and you're bringing a group of young men together, under new head coach and getting everybody on the same page. Right about now, the mid point of the season is when everything starts kicking in and, and teams start playing well. And I think that's what you saw out of the Raiders last week. Of course, the Raiders, I mean, they have not had a winning season in 10 years. Uh, it, it, does this look like a team, a current team, that may be able to break that mark? Are they, do you believe they're still even in the division race? I mean, the divisions, the other teams are at 3-3. Three and three. Do there, Are the Raiders still alive? And by that proxy, are the Chiefs still alive? Um, you know, that's a great question. And I think for both those teams, the Chiefs and the Raiders, it's, you know, who salvages their season. Um, I would anticipate, and this is just me saying anything could happen, but I would anticipate that their new regime and new coach is in place. And their turnaround, their arrows kind of pointing up, if you will. Um, they can, you know, they're getting better each week. They're gelling together. They, they're getting, an, you know, an identity of who they are and they get a, Good feeling of what's expected of them. We're, you know, we're still in disarray. You know, that's the sad part about it. We're, we're just kind of floundering around out there, and there's real, you know, there's no real direction of, of where to go. We, we we don't know what we are. We don't have anybody leading us, and you know, something's got to happen. And, and you know, I don't know if it'll be good for this team. Uh, you know, they'll win a game or two here or there, but I don't know if it's good for this team to to, to you know contend for the division or end up, uh, you know, seven and seven, seven and nine or eight and eight. I, I just, I, I don't think that's the answer for long-term success. Yeah, and that brings me to my next point about the split or separation between the fans right now. Some fans are not jumping ship, but uh, kind of rooting for losses, I guess I could say, so that we could get a franchise quarterback in here. And some people are still totally supporting this team and rooting that we can get into the playoffs just to get there? Well, I, I think that, you know, there's there's a, categ- there's a couple different categories of fans. You know, there's a they're casual fan, and, and, you know, they're just, you know, they're casual. Um, and they go out to Arrowhead, or they, or they get to go to somebody's home on a Sunday, and, you know, it's a social thing. Um, and then there's a fan, you know, that's... I'm Kansas City, and if it's Kansas City, that's it. We're, we're, we're with it. We're going to support you. And that support has been important, you know, because it's, it's, I've played in that stadium before when there's like, you know, 18,000 people in the stands. Um, you love those people. You do. I mean, I feel for them. I mean, I, I, you know, I want nothing more than what they want. Uh, and I, I want to see them uh, celebrate a modern-day Super Bowl. Um and, and, and those people are important, but then there's the, the educated sports fan, you know, that they get everything that's going on. They understand it. Uh, they understand the business side of it. You know, this, and, and, and they feel insulted. And, and I think there's a number of those, a good number of those, that, uh, you know, aren't going to tolerate, you know, being taken advantage of. And I, and I get that. And I do, I, I do get that, you know, if, it, 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 it's no more than planning a, a family budget, okay? Uh, if you're going to plan a family budget, you're going to go down as everything you have, your in things you absolutely need and things that are luxury, and, and this is what we have and this is what we have to spend. And, you know, there, there's a lot of educated people out there that look at the product and could analyze it and say, no, they're not getting my money. And then there's the others, it, it doesn't matter. That's in a necessity category. So he kind of sums up, you know, where the two people side on, on you know, where it budgets in their lives. And, and that's okay. I, I get it. I, I'm my heart, man. I, I love them. They supported me for years, and, and I, I get it. Um, but I also understand the other side, too. It's when you look at it and say, no, 
I am not going to give you my money when you're not doing the right thing for the, for the product out on, out on the field. The team should be the utmost important thing out there. If the team was the utmost important thing out there, every single thing else would take care of itself. You wouldn't have to worry about profits. They'd be rolling in. And, and that's an interesting point because, you know, talking about profits, uh, Jason Whitlock, love or hate him, wrote an article recently, you know, talking about how teams are basically making profits whether there's a fan in the stadium or not due to television revenue. I mean, do you feel right. do you feel like that that could uh, that that fact could hamper uh, Clark Hunt's you know judgment as far as you know maybe pulling the plug on this regime and starting over? Well, I, I think my personal opinion is I think you know and I Clark one is ready to make that move. Clark is embarrassed. This is Clark's team. Clark brought this thing together. He wants to. He doesn't like. He feels like he's been lied to, taken advantage of. He doesn't like the situation. And my understanding of it is he, he, he's ready to make a move. Um, now, the problem is that Clark's just one of five Hunt families that are in this process. You know, you have Clark, you have Daniel, you have Lamar Jr., you have his daughter, and you have Norma. And, you know, maybe all those you know components together can see what maybe you were talking about or what Jason Whitlock wrote about in his article. It's a different, you know, hey, we're comfortable. Uh, when we have to make a change and pony up about 10 to $12 million in a loss for one year with the salaries of of the general manager and some of the others that go along with him, uh, that, it, that might be a hard pill to swallow for them at this present time. But if the status quo continues, uh, I, I don't think they'll have a choice. Uh, what do you think about the rumors about maybe Mike Holmgren, Holmgren coming back to coach and for Kansas City? I think that's all they are is rumors. I mean, I, I, I don't see that fit here in Kansas City. Uh, Mike's a good football man. Mike's a great guy. Mike was a great coach. Um, I don't see that. I don't see. I don't think that has a leg at all. I think there's other avenues that uh, are, are could would be really really good fits for Kansas City. I don't see that as one. Well, I'll tell you what, Bill. We're going to see what happens going forward. I think we're at a crossroads here. You go to you go to one and six, and I mean, the season that was on life support is now absolutely done. So we'll see going into this Raiders game if this team has any fight left. But Bill, I'll tell you what, can't appreciate you enough for your time. Thanks so much for being on today, and we'll uh, we'll catch up soon, my man. We appreciate it. Thanks. Take it easy, guys. You too. And thanks a lot again to Bill Moss for joining us, as he has a couple times in the past, and to our guest before that, George Atkinson. Great stuff. Boy, were these guys as opposite ends of the spectrum as you can get. A, a, a Raiders lifer and a Chiefs lifer, basically. But great to have him on today. Love that. Oh, yeah, it's great to have George on. I mean, he is the Raider of all Raiders. The intimidation factor, him and Jack Tatum. I mean, I was just shivering when he called <laughs> me to come on the show. It was... Yeah, it was insane. Like, you had... We got the Raiders music playing in the background, and it's like, wow, George Atkins is on the line. Of course, Bill Moss, great guy, great insight for him on these Chiefs. I can tell what... You know what, Bill... He is not happy with how things are going. I can I can definitely tell that. He thinks a change is coming. You can, uh, he's one of those educated fans, just like we are, that wants things to change, yep. is not happy with the product, and he's going to hold people responsible, hold them accountable to make this a winner. I hope so. And guys, we really appreciate it. Uh, make sure you're hitting us up on all of our social network outlets on Twitter, Chiefs Outsiders, and on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Outsiders Podcast. And make sure to check out our website, theoutsiderspodcast.weebly.com. Guys, for all your convenience, we have all of our interviews archived on the website, so make sure you go check those out. We appreciate it. Come to our page, give us a like, and uh, make sure you give us your feedback on this team, on, on, on the podcast, and how you think things are going. Plus, on the website, we have our Chiefs News articles by Clint and myself, Noah Groniger. We also have our very new message board. Make sure you sign up for that. Yes. We want to hear all your thoughts, anything. We've got all kinds of sports on there. We want to hear your thoughts. Come on and talk some trash. Anyway, guys, Chiefs and Raiders on Sunday at 3 p.m. out at Arrowhead Stadium. We will see you there. Chiefs and Raider Week, signing off. The Raiders.